So when I was uh, at Monolith the last time, I bought this. Roman and I bought the last two of these. Cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I fucking love these. Um, I, as a result of this, I started re uh, collecting them. So I only have three. I, have I got another one for you. I got another one for you, Toss, because we have access now to uh, um, like a really top of the line uh, laser etcher. Oh, so we have, yeah. So we've been like the merchandise we have now is like etched, and we have some more flasks. So oh, you nice. got a knife. I'll, 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 I'll pick, pick a few things out for you. All right. Cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I started, uh, I only have three. I, I got this one. I have an armored saint one, and I bought a goat whore one. They were here a couple of weeks ago. And I the got ones, the I hate guy ones are cool too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to make a little shelf and put them all up there. So I, I hear you. I do. And then fill them up, and then just every now and then just take a swig. All right. <laughs> all right, greetings. Welcome to the Zero Hour Square Classics. My name is Mike Trujillo. I'm the host of this program, and uh, it is with a, a lot of great pleasure and happiness that I introduce our guest today on the Zero Hour Square Classics. Somebody who's been um, uh, having very close, um, how should I say it, but uniquely close uh, relations with New Mexico in one way or another. I, I, I didn't know yeah. how to frame that, but Wino, you've been coming through here, and uh, that's who we're talking to right, right now. We're talking to Scott Wino Weinrich. Is it Weinrich or Ryan Weinrich? How do you prefer? It's Weinrich. Weinrich. All right. Wino, a legend. Wino, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Scott Wino, a legend in the game, in the business. Again, uh, some uh, close ties to New Mexico as of late, particularly because they played the monolith uh, on the Mesa in Taos in 2019. That was the first uh, of uh, first time for that event. But uh, the Obsessed has been coming through here. You came through Albuquerque with St. Vitus. Okay. Uh, more recently, uh, you were here for a memorial for uh, Dano Sanchez, and I believe that was October 23rd, and you did a, uh, an acoustic set. For yeah. Dano. And we'll get into uh, all of that coming up here pretty uh, soon, uh, particularly yeah. Monolith on the uh, Mesa and Dano. But I want to ask you, first and foremost, how you doing, Wino? It's great to have you on the show. How's everything going? Everything is going great. Uh, we're getting ready to leave on our U.S. tour, you know, on the way to Taos ta ta um, in about six days. And so, like, I live in upstate New York with uh, with my girl. And basically, we have... a. Uh, and rehearsals here and stage here. So those dudes are all, will all be here tonight and we're going to start full on rehearsals. They, 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 they just live here and we rehearse until we leave. Uh, we're like, you know, we're, we're blessed to have like a pretty remote pad. We have an addition on there that we turn into the jam room. I did want to say something about New Mexico though. New Mexico is like really dear to my heart because uh, before, you know, before this was happening, I guess this is when the, some years ago, this is probably in the late eighties. Uh, I dated a, a, a lady from Vegitas. Ah, uh, yeah, and her, her father worked in worked in um, a Santa Fe, and so like I was out Las Lunas Vegitas, you know, uh, doing some stuff with her family and stuff. And I just always just love the love the land and the trip, and you know, chicharrones and you know the whole the whole everything. And so I just wanted to say that. Oh, cool, cool, man. Well, if you if you know uh, the, the tiny little towns like that, and the, you know the chicharrones and all that good stuff, then you yeah. are you're an honorary New Mexican, as far as we're concerned, man. I was I was indoctrinated into the culture, and, and, and I embrace it. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, yeah. you know, let's um let's take a step back and talk about the obsessed and and kind of you know I want to do a little uh, backstory history of of the band. Because you've okay. got a lot of history, you've been through a lot, yeah. you've seen a lot, you've gone, you've gone through, you, you've lived through every trend, every genres, a crossover, all that stuff. You basically, got started in the mid '70s, but kind of tell us how how you got into this business and how you got the obsessed going and and basically everything that uh, that entails what Wino does. All right, okay, so you know, I I always felt like I was hardwired to want to play guitar. I mean, for, as early as I can remember. I wanted to play electric guitar. I mean, I got into first the Monkees, then the Beatles. I'm still love the Beatles, but then I got into Hendrix, John McLaughlin. You know, uh, I eventually my first guitar was it was a Silvertone, but I didn't know anything about setting them up or anything like that, so it was really hard to play. So I saved up some money. Uh, I was working. I saved up some money and I bought my, bought an SG. Right. So 
we didn't put the obsessed together until uh, some in, in the mid '70s. Uh, in 1976, I bought my first Les Paul Custom. It was 600 bucks, brand new. And uh, we we started the obsessed. Me and uh, uh, Mark Lowey. He was like a little bit older than me. We had met in the neighborhood that we lived in, and he was like sort of like my mentor. He knew a little bit more about electronics and stuff. Like he was the guy that showed me how to like you know, overdrive a preamp to get the grind out of an amp. He was really into low end. He explained, you know, impedance and stuff to me. That was kind of like the roots of my, because I'm really into like, I'm kind of a gearhead, you know, I'm really into the tech aspect of it too. And so that, that was what started that, you know? So, so we put the obsessed together. Uh, first we were two guitar band and I can remember the very first gig, the very first professional gig that we ever did. Uh, I was dating this girl and she said, uh, okay, well, there's this guy Ripple. He used to be in, there's a motorcycle, 1% motorcycle gang right here. And she's like, you know, at the time I had, you know, I've always been into bikes. So I had my bike and I met this girl and she was a bartender down in DC. She said, yeah, well, the owner, uh, you know, or the guy that does the booking is, you know, an ex, an ex club member. And, you know, I know him, I'll call him on a 10 bar day. Or why don't you go down there and talk to him? So the very first thing, professional move that I ever made is that like, we had these really nice resumes made and I drove down, drove my van down to downtown DC, like rush hour. I met this cat, you know, he's setting up the chairs and the place was called Beneath It All, all right? It was a wine cellar, basically. They would turn into a venue and above it was this huge meat market strip club, but this little place called Beneath It All was like a stone. Like it basically really was a wine cellar at one point. So I met him, he said, okay, I like your attitude. I'll give you a gig. You got to play, you got to come up on Wednesday night and play three 45 minute sets, right? Okay. And so, you know, we had to do, we, we were forced to do some covers and we were really into punk rock. We had two guitar players. The other guitar player was the guy who turned me on to jazz. Like he was really into like hard bop. He was really cool, and really great. But the only thing was, is like, he could never get it together to come back, you know, come back in time after solos. He was always out of tune. And so we started with that, you know, and we did like, you know, a whole barrage of gigs with, with that lineup. And then finally, we had to part ways because he just wasn't, he wasn't professional enough, you know? So we went to, at that time, we decided, look, we need to get a lead singer. And I wasn't even singing back then. And so basically the bass player, just the same guy, you know, Mark Lowe, he said, uh, let's look for a singer. So we put an ad out looking for somebody that had the properties of Iggy, Morrison, Ozzy, you know, we wanted to include the heavy with the punk, and we got it. Uh, we went down to the local guitar store where I bought my Les Paul. And this guy goes, I know just the guy. And he gave me his number. So I called the dude up and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm in a cover band. I'll be doing this down at Louis Rock City, which is this huge venue in Virginia where I saw Priest the first time. I was, he was playing with this cover band down there. So I rode down, drove down there in my van and checked him out. His name was Vance Bacchus. And he was, I thought he was cool. I mean, his, his, uh, his persona was huge. I mean, the stage antics were fantastic. I mean, his voice was okay, you know. And uh, so I went down there and that night we got my first DUI coming back. From, oh man! <laughs> from my man. And then I got thrown in the, uh, the same jail where uh, Roy Buchanan actually, where well, the cops killed Roy Buchanan and they said he hung himself in Virginia. I mean, they still got the brown shirts and shit, man. It's like pretty, pretty crazy, you know, cops down there. But anyways, all that, that's just a little bit of lore on the side there. So I met Vance. Vance joined the band and we put together a band with him singing. So we did this brief period where we kind of had like a full on punk rock thing going on. Um, we were still playing beneath it all. So we still now had to play, the, you know, uh, three 45 minute sets. So we were doing stuff like we were playing decimation and some of the, uh, our originals that live today, but we were also playing like dead boy songs, like call it to meet your mouth and love some studio shit off rough power. We played some dictator stuff. So, I mean, the covers we did were like, I thought pretty cool, you know, now right around this time, all the local punks from D.C. that were in the big bands, like, well, at the time they weren't big, but like, you know, Henry Rollins was in SOA still, hadn't joined Flag yet. Uh, Wendell Blow was in Iron Cross. And those dudes would come down and sit beneath it all, and like, they hated the punk rock covers. They hated when we played punk rock covers, you know. But they didn't understand it because we had long hair. We were like, kind of like, you know, we were more like suburban guys, you know. But uh, but they loved our originals. And I remember, like, Wendell would I'd hear him yelling out, decimation, you know. And um, so that, that went up for a while. And eventually, you know, the singer Vance, and, you know, he's dead now. And, and he was a great guy, but he also had some, some problems. And uh, 
he started embezzling from the band and whatnot, and we had we had let him go. We, we were always like, me and my mentor with the bass player, Mark Lowey, and then our drummer, Dave, we called him Dave the Slave. We all lived in a house together, you know? We got a house together, we rehearsed there, we lived together. I mean, we were all best friends. And so, you know, bringing in these other, bringing in Vance was cool, but Vance had some really fucked up shit. I mean, you know, like he fucked a drummer's girlfriend, you know, that kind of shit while he's in the band kind of shit, you know? And uh, uh, drummer's so cool, he said, fuck it. I kicked a girl out. I'm still in the band. I don't like really like bands, but I'll still play in the band. I, you know, kind of hard to believe, but I mean, that's how we were. We were tight. And so we let bands go. And then the bass player says to me, he says, man, you know, you ought to sing. I was like, I don't know. You know, it's like, it, I never, it never really gave them a thought. It seemed pretty daunting, but that's what we did. I started singing because we were playing all of our originals by, you know, and, um, I finally figured out after the first record we did that for the purple record we did, I finally figured out that if I tuned down a half step and that pulled it all into focus for my range and my voice. So that's what I did from then on. And, and then I just sort of like, you know, my confidence grew and, uh, and that led to us being, you know, a power trio with me singing. And, uh, we, we carried that on for quite a while until, uh, we didn't really have anything really going on. We played, you know, we played some out-of-state shows. We played New York City. We played Philly. Nothing was really happening. And then the drummer said, look, i got to make some, you know, life decisions. I'm going to go to New York, move to New York City and go to art school. So he did. So we got another drummer for a little while, and that was the guy who did the Purple Record. But um, he also, unfortunately, uh, had, had some pretty heavy issues. And so then the band was dissolved, you know. So at that time... Right around that time is when uh, uh, St. Vitus rolled through town. And a friend of mine had turned me on to St. Vitus, and um, I was really into them, you know, and I was just a fan. I was just totally a fan. So they missed their first show because uh, this whole trip where the singer got left behind at the rest stop, and it, he got totally oil spotted, but it was at night. Nobody knew, realized there's no cell phones back then. So because of that, they were late. They missed the whole first show, but they stayed with a friend of mine that night. They got into town late, stayed with another guy who turned them on to the obsessed, okay? Now, at the time, Scott Riegers knew he was going to leave. So he heard the obsessed, and so when they came back through, this is what they were talking with the brood, and this is like with the brood, I mean, that off that suicidal, like, was it a suicidal offshoot band maybe? It was Amory was the drummer. It was his band, uh, the brood. So – they came back through with the brood and uh, I got a chance to see him, you know, and uh, man, they didn't make any money, you know, here I was helping them load their gear at the end of the night, you know, I gave them 20 bucks for gas, you know, they're in my hometown. And uh, that's when the singer, you know, Scott Rieger, he says to me, he goes, man, you know, uh, I don't want to make an announcement, but I'm, you know, I'm planning on leaving. And he goes, how do you feel about replacing me? Because, you know, I love your voice. This is Scott. This was just Scott said, this wasn't David yet. So I said, man, I mean, I'd love to do that. I was completely floored you know I immediately wheels started turning and uh and so i pursued it you know after after they left stuff i started calling david and chandler okay i gotta tell you like i was coming off my punk rock we had this kind of like death glam thing going on like back in the punk rock days so i had kind of like a pineapple haircut you know used to wear our makeup shit. and chandler straight up he said well i don't know man you look like a you know fag and i was like i was like well, i said well that was just a phase man that was just a phase, you know, give me a chance. And so he's like, well, I don't know yet. I finally talked him into, I hammered him, I hammered him. And uh, from Maryland to California, I'm hammering him from Maryland because I live in Maryland. Yeah. So I'm all the way on the East Coast. And so I just kept hammering him. I knew I was going to join that band. I was determined to join that band. And uh, so I just hammered him, man. And he said, he brought me out for an audition, but I moved. I knew I wasn't, I wasn't going back. And uh, I got those dudes. I brought a strobe tune around. And I got those dudes to tune down. From where they would normally tune out to a half step. Once I got did that, it all pulled it into focus. We that's when I joined the band. They, the Chandler said I could join the band, and uh, and uh, you know that was it. And th that's what started like uh, a really interesting, the next interesting period of my life when I moved to California. You know, joined St. Vitus. We rehearsed before we re uh, recorded Born Too Late. We rehearsed like six days a week. No, every day we were like a fucking well oiled machine. I remember. The place that we played in was like this little back back house, you know, little shack back house, and it was knee deep, filled up with Budweiser cans. I mean, we would have, we would do that on purpose, you know. I'd wade in there, you know what I mean, you know. And it was fucking uh, so we, you know that was cool, and and I really felt like uh, 
you know, David wrote all the lyrics, and everything. David wrote all the songs. I mean, I didn't write any lyrics really on Born Too Late or anything, and, and you know, until later on. But um, I was happy singing those songs. I identified it with everything. I really felt like uh, that was my calling. And you know, when I joined that band, you know, I knew we were going to struggle. I mean, I knew I wasn't joining to make money or, you know, I mean, th that was, wasn't really even in the picture. Of course, I wanted to survive. And of course, I still, you know, my dreams were, were lofty as far as, you know, my career. But, you know, I knew we were going to, I joined it because I want like the music and that was, that was it. Right, right. Yeah. Man, those were two of the most crucial bands that you've been in, the Obsessed, obviously, and St. Vitus, but to a wide variety of how hard rock, heavy metal, punk rock, hardcore, I mean, several different genres were, were crossed with, with those two crucial bands. And of course, Obsessed is still around. St. Yeah. Vitus is still around in its own incarnation. Um, I want to share a story with you. The last time and the first time and the only time that I saw St. Vitus with you was a few years here back in Albuquerque. And well, uh, I remember David was upside down in the crowd. Is that that, that, that I, light? I think so. It was the one where you had the bottle of Jack and you were sharing it with people in the audience and everybody was getting all fucked up and it was cool, man. And you started playing, you guys started playing War is Our Destiny. And I was like, oh, man. Yeah. And that was that was one of my favorite concert moments of all time, man. Because uh, and, and watching you up on stage with with Dave Chandler and all of that, that was kind of weird for me because it was it was kind of a like a dream dream come true getting two for the price of one because I had not seen you with uh, the obsessed until a little bit after that, if I'm right, not mistaken. Right, right. You know? cool. So yeah, I mean those those, those were great days. I mean, um, you know, every, every everything was everything was pretty hard hitting. I mean. At by that point, the inviters. I mean, you know, I remember that night really well. I mean, uh, because David, when David always goes into the crowd during more too late, you know, yeah. he walks around and he does his trip, he, he drops do yeah. tricks, you know, he, you know, down down into the tits, and you know, his whole trip, you know, out the out in the crowd. He likes to walk around and hey, when he has control. But in Albuquerque that night. The crowd did. They, they didn't understand what he was trying to do. Yeah. They thought he was just trying to get in in the crowd, and they he went up and I, I, for one second I saw him completely <laughs> upside down with his guitar and everything. He was upside down, and That's he would freak out. He freaked him out. And he was so mad, you know, that he, he went storming out the back door and kicked the door open. And weirdly enough, like one of his long lost cousins that he never even met had come down to the show, couldn't get in, and was outside the back door, and like, kicks the door open, you know, all mad, you know. That, that, was a great, that was a fucking great show. You know? Yeah, yeah, I remember him getting pissed off. Now I remember that. He was fucking upside down the first second. I mean, I saw it. He was upside down with the guitar still plugged in because he didn't get to do his trip. He didn't get to do his trip. Like, like my thing with, my thing with, with um, you know, with stage diving stuff was like, I was, you know, some nights when the energy was high, I would, I would always do that. I mean, if I knew to put my wallet in my pants, you know, and you just lay flat. And every single time I would do that, whether it was in Europe, the States, if I if I would just lay flat and let the crowd carry me, they would get me back to the stage almost every time. And almost every time on beat, ready to sing. It was like, those days were so great. But if she went south, you know, like if, if David broke a string and then he picked up his spare, I broke a string on a spare, and then, you know, Henry broke a drum, so there was no hope. Then I would dive into the crowd, you know, take the heat off everybody, you know what I mean? Because it was over, you know. Ah, fucking crazy, man. So yeah. that, you, you, you're, you're setting me up for so many questions, man, because there's, there, you know, you're just giving me a whole bunch of really good stuff, I know. And I appreciate you doing this <laughs> on a Saturday, man. First yeah, man, it, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it, man. I mean, uh, uh, my guys are all here. Or we're waiting on our bass player, and then, we're going to start rehearsing this evening. And I, there's nothing I'd like better than talk to you about. So the, the road, you live on the road. You have been, that's what the Obsessed, that's what Wino does. And, you know, um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that have always drawn parallels to you guys and Motorhead. Because to me, growing up listening to Motorhead and listening to you guys, and you, there were some, uh, what, what I thought were some parallels, and, the, and those being kind of just this, this free life. This kind of like, you know what? Fuck everything. This is what and who I am, respect it or don't. 
But if right. you don't respect it, you're going to get your teeth probably kicked in. And if you do, we're brothers for a very long time because I find you to be a very respectful in, individual, particularly, you know, when, when I hear about um, folks long term in the scene and stuff, I never hear anything bad about Wino doing being a dick. I always hear hey, Wino is fucking rad, you know, and that's uh, I, I think that that. Uh, you have that relatability with people, and that's why I think they're drawn so much to the obsessive. It's important. So it's important. I mean, it's important. I mean, you got to treat people the way you want to be treated, you know. Right. But it's also important to put yourself in your brother's shoes. I mean, I always put myself in my brother's shoes. You know, you, you have to make, you have to really see what everybody else is playing. You know, like people are so uh, people are kind of fucked, you know. And uh, you know, the first thing I think about is we got to pay these dudes that are helping us. You know. That's the first thing I think about. It. I mean, I know this dude's broke. You know, he can't drive home in the dough. You know, he came out with us for a month. You know, that's the first I think about him first. You know, because uh, because that's what turns turns the wheel. You know, and and as far as like, uh, man, you know, I just always think that I always think the music should talk. You know, but I will say, you know, living on the road and that kind of life, uh, the way we do it. I mean, we are not. A, a lot of people think you know that we're like that I'm a huge rock star and have all this dough. There's this online site that, uh, I guess, estimated what my net worth is, you know. And they're saying, oh, I've got boats and trains, and whatever, whatever it might be. But the bottom line is, you know, it's like we live hand to mouth and, and we load our own gear. I mean, if we can, if we can hire somebody, which we're able, I think we're going to do this time, then, um, you know, we'll bring somebody to help us. I mean, we consider, us, we consider it a luxury if we can have somebody to help us load gear and tech, you know. Right. And, of course, we went, you know, this whole, this whole fucking, you know, I'm not going to get down on, on the, on the, on the medical issues and all that shit because it, it brings a lot of heat, even though things have gone, changed again. But bottom line is, you know, that really set us back. That set everybody back. That took me off the road. It took me out of my, my, uh, uh, you know, my livelihood for however long it was. And, you know, I think it was fucking really fucking evil and, and that's all i'm gonna say so that took it that set us back but you know now we're, we're at it again and so hopefully you know we're trying to uh miraculously miraculously i mean i don't want to get ahead ahead of ahead of, ahead of you but miraculously the two we've got two uh, another guitar player in the band now the obsessed and the bass player both of those dudes came to the table you know not a lot of little kids by any stretch of magic. Not not old, old guys, old guy, not as old as me, but you know, with no ties, the hunger to travel, and and the ability to do it. So I feel completely blessed, man. You know, right? Yeah, you have um, pretty remarkable. You know, especially you brought up everything that that that's gone down the last couple of years. And real quickly, before we move on, I want to remind everybody that you will be playing, you're getting ready to embark on this new tour, two dates. New Mexico will have the privilege of having two dates of, yeah. of the Obsessed and Wino. Now, you're going to be playing as the Obsessed at the Monolith on the Mesa, which will be over in Taos, New Mexico, and that's uh, our, our brother Roman Barham's uh, big event. Um, happening again in Taos. It's the uh, 16th. Let's see. You guys are going to be on the... I just got my dates wrong here. I want to make sure I got them, got them right. What's our date? The, the, yeah, the 16th for Monolith. The okay. 16th is our, is our date, yeah. Okay, so you guys will be the 16th. Uh, that's the Friday yeah, at the cool. Monolith on the Mesa. And then at Launchpad, you will be uh, Monday the 27th of September. Yes. So, so again, two dates. And that is as wine Right, is that the acoustic yeah. set? Yeah, it's an acoustic set. I mean, I, I don't really know all the politics behind how, how that came to be, but uh, I think maybe because we're playing monolith, you know, you got to pay attention to politics, however the promoters do. But that's how it ended up. Okay. I'm, I mean, I, I don't really, I wouldn't really want to do it necessarily anywhere else because you know, playing acoustic guitar with with metal bands is always is always challenging, you know. Right. You, you know? But I mean, at in Albuquerque at the launch pad with you know with everybody, it'll be it'll be fine, man. It'll be great. So I did catch you do an acoustic set. And we were talking about Dano Sanchez, uh, his memorial, which was October twenty third. The other acoustic set that I caught you do was at Monolith on the Mesa, the first go round in two thousand nineteen. Yeah. That and was the, a lot of fun. 
Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a hell of a time. That whole, uh, that whole weekend was a lot of fun. Um, also, I, I remember catching you uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, shortly oh, after yeah. watching Abu Ghraib. It was it was kind of weird. It was like we were crossing paths, and it was it was yeah. really cool, man. Just some some intense things going on. But but you've been busy. There's always something going on with you. Yeah. I know you're kind of working on a documentary. Tell us what 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 you are doing besides uh, uh you know all the stuff with the band. But like I mentioned, documentary, other stuff, artwork. Yeah, documentary is, is 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 a really big deal. Okay, my my lady is a uh, is a uh, a screenwriter and uh, uh, producer, movie, movie producer, and and, and also uh, on hand film. So we decided, I guess it's two years ago. She, she, she's here. It's three years in the making. Okay, so You're on camera if you like. Oh no no no! <laughs> <laughs> she said no. But but uh, it's been three years in the making, and she did it entirely herself. I mean, we hired one dude to help us with the audio, a friend of ours, and you know, basically what it was is. Uh, since I'm into custom motorcycles, my friend in, in uh, my friend in Texas, uh, Matt Jackson in Austin, he's a custom bike builder. We're good friends. We know each other from the music. From you know, he's he was in the town of Van Zandt, Vitus stuff. I played some acoustic shows in Austin along with you know Vitus. We got to know each other pretty good, and so he agreed to do some fabrication for me and all that. I mean, taking my motorcycle from from uh, New York, to Texas, uh, is pretty extreme. But you know, I mean, I love I love Texas. I love the area. I love New Mexico. I love Texas. That's you know, those are my stomach grounds. And so, you know, we have friends there. So we decided. Surely had this idea for for the documentary on my career, and so we had this idea to, on the trip across to Texas, to try to start interviewing as many people in the rock rock community and friends as we could. And so basically, we we tied it around you know getting the motorcycle, but we interviewed. Uh, it turned out to be a great thing. The first person we did before we left was Bobby. We got a great interview with Bobby Lee. Then we went to fucking North Carolina. Got a great interview with Dixie and Chef. You know, Weed Eater. Then we went, you know, on and on. You know, finally made Texas. Matt Jackson, Brittany Elliott, Henry Vasquez. You know, all doing some talking some great stuff. Interspersed with like other friends of ours that you know everybody might not know in the, in the rock world, but are personal friends of ours from in different areas. People that have been influenced on me. We took some cuts. We edited some cuts from the very first success documentary with Ian and Joe and Henry. And, um, you know, we got, uh, we got a lot of, we got a lot of really fucking good shit. And so, uh, we just finished, we just finished it. I mean, Ooh. surely did, you know, editor after the last three years, that's what she's been doing. Editing this thing down. And, um, it came out really, it came out really good. I'm, I'm super proud of her. I'm super proud of the doc really. I mean, it's pretty, it's kind of like an offset thing, you know, documentary would be made about me. So she would do the interviewing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. She would interview the person because it's kind of weird about it. But um, so we got Bauer, uh, kind of, I miss people. We got Pepper, we got Bauer, we got Weed Eater, Pentagram. There's a trailer up on new terms.com. Okay, I'll, I'll I just put it up last night. If you want to see the trailer or if you want to advertise the trailer, it's on, uh, it's a, we have a, our website or we have a, a main website. It's, uh, New, N-E-U. Or N-E-W. No, N-E-W. N-E-W, I meant. Dash terms. Dot com. Dot com. Like, so it's already yeah. complete. What's that? So it's already complete and, and, and ready to run. It's in its entirety. Or you it's just have already ready to run? As of last night. <laughs> As of last night. Oh, cool. All right, yeah. man. Congratulations. So Congratulations. what's the title of it? Why no? The documentary. <laughs> Okay. Why know the documentary? Fair yeah, enough. Why know the documentary? Well, cool, man. I'm glad that because I saw that you were working on that. And as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, Roman, you I think you oh, yeah. Roman? we did a great we did a great interview with Roman with Roman after after Donna's memorial. Uh-huh. Came to the hotel the next the next uh day and we sat out and sort of courtyard and did a great interview. Yeah. Well, I, I can't think of a, a another individual that I would want to see. Uh, a documentary about more than you, man. This is this is really really cool. Um, but again, Oh
time and when you hear like when i was growing up i got into um thrash uh and and hardcore and crossover around 82 83 84 um and i would always hear your name in circles but it, it wasn't as easy to find your stuff as it is now you know with the internet right. but back then do you remember how you know you were like oh i found this you know i found yeah. this obsessed album where i found this album and so, you know, when I would hear your name, it was kind of like, uh, like, a, like a mythos, man, like a legend. Like, have you heard of Wino's new shit? Wino, I've heard his shit, but I haven't heard. It was cool. So getting to talk to you and, and seeing that you've been doing this stuff all these years and decades is, is, is highly meaningful to me. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Probot. 18 years ago, that album was put out. 18 God, years. Yeah, man, I can't even believe. That's hard to believe, really. Really? Right? Already, yeah. That's a, that's insane. Oh, I was man. married. I was married. I was living in Maryland. Uh, mm -hmm. I had two two kids at that point. No, I had three kids at that point. And my my daughter was was just really really newborn. I had my two boys, my daughter living living in uh you know domestic life in in Maryland. And uh, I remember the. I was, we were, me and my ex-wife, she's my ex-wife now, we were driving back from the beach when I got this call. So we, we'd already done the ProBot song. The way the ProBot happened, you want me to tell you how it went down? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we were living in Maryland. You know, we, I think at that time we had like one child or maybe two. I can't remember. But um, I was on tour. I think it was a tour of Spirit Caravan. And uh, my ex-wife calls me and says, okay, well, you know, Dave Grohl called. And he's doing this project, and uh, he wants you to sing and play guitar on a song, and uh, you know, and he uh, he sent the song, and um, at the time, like we, you know, we were traveling in Europe with Spear Caravan, and I remember that I was like, I was into some heavy, I was doing some heavy reading. Like I don't really like reading fiction that much. Some stuff, but usually I'm into like you know history, archaeology, biographies. So I was reading uh, some stuff about, um, you know, uh, Babylon, ancient Babylon, because I was reading Zechariah Sitkin, actually. He's one of the few people uh, that could translate uh, Babylonian uh, stella. He could translate their, 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 their writing form, which carving into the, in the stone. Uh, cuneiform, cuneiform, so it's called. So I was reading this cool-ass fucking story, and it had a poem there with it, you know? Okay? All right, so let's store that up. So I get back to the Maryland, you know, I hear the tune. It's right up my fucking alley. Like, it's just the bare bones of the tune. It's just the guitar, you know, the drums and the bass. So I totally dig it. So right away, I put together the tune, which is, uh, it's called the Emerald Law. And what's that, what's that about is about how, you know, the, the uh, you know, the Akashic Records, is that how you pronounce it? The Akashic Records of life? Akashic. Akashic Records are, are carved into an emerald tablet it's un supposedly buried underneath the paws of the Sphinx, right? This is some, like a cult lore, right? So it's kind of about that, you know, a little bit of bloodline of Christ thrown in there too, right? But at the very at the very beginning of the tune, I was like, man, it needs something, needs something. And so what I say at the very start is, uh, is ancient Babylonian. It's an ancient Babylonian um, uh, poem. And, I, you know, I do not dream, you know, I mean... I do not live. Uh, I do not die. I do not die. But awaken to the dream I, I live. live. <laughs> Her memory is better than me. But, you know, it's, it's, it's like, so that was a beautiful thing, and it gelled. And uh, I actually got to record my track with Grohl. We were going to do it in his studio in, in Virginia, but he'd left his tape machine on for, like, six months and fried it. So we went to Discord. We went to where Discord, all the DC bands recorded at, uh, at Inner Year. With Don's the guitar, and we, and we did, did our track there. And uh, I sang it, and he was like, just want me to play guitar. He egged me on, on the, you know, he's in the control, egging me on on that solo on that one band. He's just like, hold it, hold it, you know. It, it was a great, it was fucking great, great. I mean, I thought the song came out fantastic. Uh, so then that that led to, uh, then one day we were driving back to the beach, me and my ex wife after that, and I get this call, and he said, hey, uh, you want to play, uh, uh, you want to be in this video? With uh with Greg Anderson 
and uh, and David and, and Eric Wagner doing his song. He's doing, doing oh, My Tortured Soul. Sweet. And you can find that on the, I don't know if you've seen that. You can see that on Jamie Josta when he hosted uh, Headbangers Ball. Oh, he no. Yeah, but on there, we all talked, you know, we, and we played that song. Nice. There was like, it was, uh, Greg Anderson played guitar. I played guitar. Girls on drums. Girls recording engineer, Nick Graskalinas played bass. And then Wagner sang, and we did My, My Tortured Soul, you know. And when I met when I met Rasky Linus, he said he's from Tennessee, and he said, "Man, I saw you in 1980, whatever, uh, high on LSD at the Snake Snatch Lounge in Knoxville. The Snake Snatch Lounge in Knoxville, and that was true. That was true. That was a great, great, great connection. You know, that's there's awesome. Stories, there's stories around there too because I've been slandered in the press on Crown Magazine. This one dude, uh, this guy Don King, uh, I think his name is Don King. He slammed me in the press, and like I started a lawsuit against him because he said some really handy shit. He basically said, right in this this public in Kerrang magazine that I wrote, that I held up a liquor store and was in jail. Oh, you know? yeah. I went straight. I, I just met this lawyer. Went straight to this lawyer. You know, I met this lawyer under dubious circumstances. You know, I think I retained him in fucking powder, and uh, I started this lawsuit against Kerrang. Okay, so, but then my lawyer got busted. His career is over. And that was it. So the lawsuit never went anywhere. So, but years later, here we are in the elevator. All the probot dudes, it was me, Roll, Snake from Voibod, nice. Eric Wagner, uh, Rasculinus, Anderson. We're all going up the elevator to, uh, to do an interview with this guy. And I said, What's this guy's name? He goes, Oh, yeah, it's Don King. I said, Wow. And the elevator ride was so long, I got to tell them all the story, right? And so they were just like in shock. Like, I think Grohl thought I was going to kill this guy. I said, don't worry, man. I'm, I totally got, I'm respecting you here. Nothing's going to happen. You know, and we walk in there. I said, just watch his reaction when he sees me. We walk in there, you know, and he sees it on with everybody. It's like, kind of like gets weird. He's like, he waited. He interviewed like five members and waited to me for last because he knew that I was going to ask him hard questions. I took it easy on him, but he fucked me over, you know. <laughs> that is incredible. Yeah. All <laughs> those years later, right? Story. That's yeah, a dude, I've got a million story. stories. All these stories that are going into a book that I'm writing too. Awesome, so, awesome. Yeah, it's like you know, kind of art. Yeah, that's been a long time coming, and I can't wait to fucking get that done. That you know, that like I said, 18 years ago, Probot, and like you mentioned, Snake from Voivod on there, King Diamond, Chronos from uh, Venom. Uh, Max Cavalera from Sepultura, you, Lemmy, um, shit, Eric Wagner. Yeah. You know, what was it was, it, what it was, is Grohl, you know, he'd been doing this Foo Fighters thing for a while. Like, I don't know whether he felt like he just needed to get back to his roots or he needed to bring his street cred up a little bit, whatever, whatever it was. Um, he wanted to keep it real kind of gritty. So he chose Southern Lord, which is, you know, underground label. Right. And he didn't want it. He didn't want it to go mainstream. Grohl didn't. Everybody else was like, Wanted it to go mainstream, you know, but, you know, but I think it did go gold, but he wanted to keep it small, you know, and that's like why the Jack Black song, which is fucking phenomenal. I Am the Warlock. That's why that song is like buried. Like after, you know, the first version of the CD or the record ends. Right. With a little while goes on before the Jack Black song come on. Yeah. And that's the song. I mean, that song is fucking genius. I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, yeah. No, it's just like one of those punk rock compilations that you would buy and you knew nobody on it and every fucking song on there kicked ass. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, what a, what a charmed life for Grohl to be able to grab all of you guys, do a song. And right. the beauty about each one of those songs is that it was really, it was alive with each individual vocalist. I mean, you brought, yeah. he, he was able to bring out Wino in that song. So you knew it was a distinct wino yeah. song. It was just Grohl behind yeah. the whole yeah. scene. So do you want to play guitar on he played guitar on all the tracks too? And I think bass. I mean, he, yeah. on my track, he played all the instruments. Except, you know, I played lead and then I, I wrote the words and sang. But I mean, you know, that was his thing. Like he, he uh, it was a tribute to his heroes, you know? Yeah. And I felt completely honored. I felt completely honored to be mentioned in that, you know, in that context. I mean, obviously he's younger than me. I remember like when, the, when his band Mission Impossible, when he was young, young, they were skinheads, these were young skinheads. He was just like a lanky, like adolescent, basically, I'm probably a teenager. And uh, his band Mission Impossible warmed up the obsessed. We got a gig with, with uh, uh, what was Waddy's band, that crazy punk band? Oh, Exploited? 
the exploit. We we got slipped on the exploit bill somehow, and uh, and Mission Possible warmed up that show with Grohl, and their claim famous they you know the last time they would play the Mission Possible theme at like seventy eight speed, you know, because you can imagine Grohl as a lanky kid blasting out those beats, you know, and uh, so that was how, that's how I met him. So we've known he'd known me. We know each other for quite a while. Then he joined Scream, you know, right. the obsessed with himself with Scream, you know. So that was really cool. Um, yeah, so I was really, I was happy to do that, man. I thought the thing was, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, um, there was a little schism that happened because, okay, a- after, uh, actually, it was before ProBot, actually. Uh, my ex wife, again, she gets the call from their management saying, hey, what's, who's Winers publishing? Because we want to cover one of his songs. Well, They'd already covered it, recorded it, but they were still giving me the giving me the, the uh, respect to, to ask for my publishing. So they recorded uh, Iron and Stone. Okay, now that it was the B side of this the Asian single for Learn to Fly. Okay, oh, there's two songs on the B side. It was our song. And it was uh, Have a Cigar by Pink Floyd. The two covers. Now they got the two songs mixed up in the print. In other words, on the record, if you got the record, uh, the single. And you went to play Have a Cigar, and that was actually Iron Stone. They got a mix up, the titles mixed up on the on the jacket, okay? But that didn't matter. But Iron Stone, the lyrics are written by my mentor, Mark Lowey, and then I wrote the music, see? That's one of these weird, weird things. So I was at Spirit Care at the time, and I, I called Mark Lowey and said, I got to talk to you, man, because we, we had an opportunity to make, uh, to have our art, have our art get out there into the world and to make a nice chunk of change, which we needed. And uh, so I called him over. We had this little talk, you know, and he was so paranoid about the industry and everything like that, that I gave him the form to fill out. It's a, it's a standard thing. We each fill out a form. He wrote the words, I wrote the music. We submit it. We get our publishing, you know. But when I got back from, from tour, I said, you got the paperwork? He's like, man, I don't know, man. I'm, I don't know. I think my lawyer needs you to sign a paper for me. And I was like, would give me a social security number? I, I, I got so pissed off. I was just like, he didn't want, he wasn't making it. He fought me to get this done or to get this, this thing. We never, we never got the fucking publishing done for that. I mean, to the tune of like, the, you know, the Asian learn to single, uh, learn to fly single. I don't know, man. At the time it would have helped me, but I mean, that's all water on the bridge. Like now I can't because all the weird, you know, all the weird shit in the way, like I've been trying to collect that and I can't, but whatever, you know, uh, David, you know, David uh, has always looked out for me. He put us on the California Jam. Uh, he's always looked out for me. I know that he there's not that much he can do for a type of band like ours. So he always wears a success T-shirt, you know. I mean, he, he's a great guy, great guy. Every interaction I had with him was completely positive. Right, right. Yeah, you know, speaking of which, you've endured decades of a wild industry and you you still are enthused you still go out there you still play i think if if you if it, if it would have killed you you wouldn't be playing monolith on the mesa coming up here in a few weeks you wouldn't be going on this full-blooded you know full full blown tour that you got set up and stuff so what is the key to keeping your sanity amongst so many people that are you know have ulterior motives and agendas and finding that one small niche of percent of people that you can actually trust. Right. Well, basically, um, um, man, it's not for the fucking, it's not for the timid, man. It's like, it's not for the timid. I mean, it is, uh, you're going to, you know, in my world, I'm going to, I'm going to struggle. And, and we continue the struggle, you know, that's, it's a dedication that I've, uh, it's what I do. It's the only thing I do. I've done a million other jobs. I've never been able to, sit still long enough to learn a trade because I'm always on the road. Um, man, you know, it's like, it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot out of you, but it also, the re- I learned uh, pretty early on that at this time of music, that my reward uh, is not uh, a bag of gold on the table. Although that's like the kind of thing that your parents like to see. They like to see you slam a uh, bag of doubloons down on the table. Yeah. But my personal reward is, uh, you know, when somebody comes up to me and says, hey, man, you know, you kept me, your music helped me through a rough time or your music kept me, helped me through a suicide um, ideas. Uh, that's my reward. And, you know, yeah. that's what it is. And, and that in of itself to me, I mean, I'm looking at you and I haven't seen you in person since, well, since the, the memorial, but you were on stage 
And the last time I saw you in person, we were doing an interview like we talked about earlier backstage at the monolith. Yeah. And it was, it was noisy. It was crazy. It was windy. I think I was pretty fucking lit up drunk. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was having a good time, but looking at you, you look really, really vibrant. You look like you're ready to go. You look, uh, yeah. you look like wino, man. You feel like wino. And that's, that's a cool thing for us. And those who have not experienced wino or the obsessed or, when you were with St. Vitus or Spirit Caravan or any one of your incarnations is going to get a treat when they check you out, this newer generation coming down to see the monolith on the Mesa. Um, There's there's also another New Mexico connection and that's Red Mesa. And that's uh, uh, for those who don't know, it's that's a New Mexico based band. They're out of Albuquerque, Roman Barham, the drummer for the band also is one of the co-founders and, um, uh, uh, co-producers of Monolith on the Mesa, but you were you did a song with them on their most recent album. Uh, the album's been out now, I think, think a little over a year, called uh, the uh, the Path to the Deathless. And the song, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the song you did with them was Disharmonious Unlife, with which yes. you vocal <laughs> fucking rule, man. And that's that's how cool. that song is. It's, it's a dark, it's a dark trip, man. It's a dark trip. Yeah, they sent me the music and asked me to do it, and when I. I was, I was, uh, I mean, I can't say I was in a weird, in a weird place, but uh, it, was, it was pre-COVID, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was, yeah. I believe it was, yeah. It was Pre-COVID, but, I mean, you know, it's like, I've been researching, you know, what's happening, in the, what's really happening in the world, and, you know, the, the, how the world is ran, really, and by the people who make big decisions, and so, you know, it, I, I've seen, like, a lot of the shit coming, you know, and uh, Disharmonious in Life was, you know, commenting on, on those kind of tri- trips, you know. I wondered what those lyrics meant. That was one that had me a little bit stumped, kind of open to interpretation, but um, it's a, yeah, it's a yeah. complex song. And, you know, it was incredible. It's a complex song. And, you know, it's like, and the, the, the lyrics might seem a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, uncohesive. And, and I just remember, like, you're putting it together. I felt like that uh, uh, there was a, just a lot, of, a lot of emotions going into it and stuff. And, uh, you know, I've been promising Roman I was going to do it you know, for a while. And, and we finally got in the studio to do it. And, and I just, once when I was in the studio, I was like, well, let's, let's just go a while. Let's play some guitar too. And, uh, <laughs> right. Well, as yeah. somebody who um, is from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and who loves Red Mesa and appreciates them, they are my some of my best friends and one of the best band that has ever come out of this state. I want to thank you personally for appearing on that song and on that album. I know that was top notch. And uh, that's something that's going to be, again, you are, part of the New Mexico brethren. You know, once you're part of that family, man, it's all green Absolutely. chili and chicharrones from there on out, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean Roman Roman and Dono pay me in bags of red chili. Nice. <laughs> That's just kidding. <laughs> I think I know what you mean, though. <laughs> but he said he sends me, I mean, he bailed me. He knows I'm in real chili, so he, too, he hooks me up, you know? Nice. I cover the man, I put it on popcorn, I, you know, I, I, I love it. Um, you know, it was really, it was un- really unfortunate and sad uh, with, with Dono. You know, I mean, I haven't known him hardly a- at all, really. I mean, I had some internet communication or whatever, and then we did Mont, we did, uh, uh, we we played the Monolith, you know, and man, those dudes totally took care of me. I mean, they're uh, in every way. They put us up in in the mothership or the uh, right. Yeah, um, I was blown away. I was blown away. I was blown away. I mean, right away, you know, we had we had mutual respect. You know, Roman and Donna running so we had mutual respect. Everything was cool. They looked after us. They did everything they said they were going to do. You know, we did what we said we were going to do. It was it was a beautiful thing. And you know, um, so after that, I communicated with Donna uh, a little bit. You know, and um, actually, sadly, um, we had been talking on Signal uh, about just about stuff. I mean. You know, he felt that was a good uh, a good venue to talk about stuff. It might be a little bit, you know, a little bit questionable with you know with the way people are censoring and the times and all that. And so, so we had been communicating a little bit on Signal, and then then I read this article about how like Signal was totally compromised, you know, already. And so I mentioned that to him, and I never looked at Signal again after that. And I, I right before I told him uh, that I said, hey, yeah, you know, because. Uh, our drummer, the obsessed drummer, um, his wife also had a similar circumstance to Donna with the hospital. And uh, I admit, I said some weird, it just happened. 
And I'd sit it down. I said, you know, some really weird shit just went down. You know, it's, it's not good. It's not right. And, and, but then I never looked at signal again. And in that interim, he had got sick, gone to the hospital. But right before he did, he asked me, well, do you mind me asking you what the weird stuff, hospital stuff was? But I never saw that message until after he had already passed. And then I decided to clean. I wanted to get rid of the signal app. So I, I looked through it, you know. And I saw his last message to me, which I never got to respond to him. And, you know, I know I can't feel guilty or anything, but in a way, but, but um, who knows, you know, maybe I could, maybe, maybe I could, it would have freaked him out enough to work, but I think he was so sick that he had to go in, you know? Yeah. And, um, and that was um, a very, very unfortunate, very tragic. The loss um, has been, resonating and and now that monolith is coming up here in a couple of weeks you know yeah. we're, we're gonna fill his soul out there um and and you know the magic of taos you know you, when you played yeah. out there and the, you yeah. talked about the mothership and how yeah. that was set up and, and earth ship, earth earth ship, earth earth ship. Earth yeah. ship. there you go mothership yeah, we're, thinking, yeah. we're thinking close encounters but uh <laughs> yeah but, but definitely the the uh earth ship and, and this the setup the layout is going to be it's so beautiful and magical up there in taos new mexico in the sky you can yeah. actually see stars and and you know whether uh, if, uh you know if you believe in, in in the ufos out there and all that stuff i do i, I believe in that kind of stuff i think yeah. it's crazy out there it's yeah. it's beautiful and that's gonna be a fun gig and there's so many bands man it's gonna be crazy you gotta pace yeah. yourself for sure you know, I got to make sure I pace myself so I don't see you at the end of the night and I barely remember anything, you know? Yeah. So um, I asked, are we playing inside or outside? I think you're playing outside. We are. Yeah. yeah. I think you're one of the headliners uh, or the headliner on that Friday night, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. I, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want, don't, don't, uh, don't. Put, no, I, I think you're right. I, uh, sure you're right yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, because uh, we played outside. Yeah. You yeah. played outside, but you also did the inside as an acoustic uh, set yeah. by yourself. That what was cool. ask you, the, what is it? <clears throat> obviously, the, the, the construction of a song is probably based off of acoustic. You know, you're just kicking back, you're writing. I, I don't know how you really go about your songwriting, but when you're playing a live set, a live acoustic set, how much different is it from this, the, the set with, with the band and the power that you feel from that what what are these some it's of radically the radically different it's radically different if the energy from the crowd i mean it's so radically different that um you could have a great sound in the hall but if your sound on stage playing acoustic is thin or weird it, it's gonna it can wig you out you know if the crowd response is weird you know the energy's not coming back the same it can be weird i mean it's it's challenging a lot of times playing acoustic it's very challenging it's also challenging when you are playing if you're sandwiched in between a couple really great metal bands, that's really challenging. And I don't like to do that. I mean, you know, why put yourself in that situation? You know what I mean? So it's like, I already know that like, you know, people will be, be there to see me, but if somebody's got me headline and acoustic, you know, like at ripple fest, uh, not this last year, but the year before, for example, uh, you know, headlining acoustic over like, you know, all these bombastic metal bands, pretty much if everybody's been there all day, Unless they're a hardcore fan, they're going to leave. Of course, Roman, you know, Roman and, and you know, uh, Chrissy say, you know, and, uh, uh, but you know what I mean? So it's challenging, but, you know, it really depends upon everything. It, it's all about confidence. You know, it's like, you know, you don't have, I don't have my, uh, you know, big wall amp behind me. You know, you don't have any, any band. But, but what I do like to do, though, is I do like to have a guest play acoustic now. And that guest uh, is my, is the new guitar player in the Obsessed. And he's an amazing virtuoso, and I'm, I'm so lucky to to for him to be a band member now. But I mean, he joins me playing acoustic now, and it's a real treat. He's he's ace player, and so you know, it's sort of like with me and Connie with stuff I did with Connie Ox. It's like you know, acoustic is great, but when you have another acoustic guitar to play off of, I mean, and that can sing and harm, you know, it just it enhances the package, you know. That's cool. I can't wait to check that out because that's going to happen in Albuquerque. Yeah, yeah, I'm intrigued by that. I, I think what you said was a, a mouthful in regards to it leaves you for, sort of vulnerable to be there, you know, just by yourself acoustically, whether without the power of your army behind them, yeah. you know, just grooving and, and ripping it out. And I right. think the vulnerability lends to the songwriting and and where we are at in the psyche of, of 
Bueno and how we, uh, some of those songs are very relatable to so many of us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the way, I, the way I usually put a song together is, whether it's acoustic or electric, is usually I have an idea, like, there, there is sort of like a separation in my mind, what's going to be electric, what's going to be acoustic. Although sometimes I overthink it. And for example, like Stranger Things off Sacred, that was going to be an acoustic tune. Uh, you know, sometimes it, I would think that, but but um, usually there's a separation. And what, any song that I write, you, if all the lyrics and the music, they all come to me in one go, that's what I call the divine inspiration. I mean, that doesn't happen all the time. Usually usually I'll get a concept in my mind, like a concept, like a title, like, you know, Disharmonious on Life or whatever it might be. And then eventually I'll, I'll find the right riff and I'll, I'll say, yeah, that'd be perfect. And then I'll meld the riff with the, with the concept, and then I start. Then I'll fill in the lyrics. You know, I'll probably have a few lyrics here and there, but I mean, on any given recording, there's usually going to be at least one song where I st- when I'm actually recording, where I've still got a little piece of paper on the floor where I'm like just tweaking like a lyric or a, a word or two just to finish it off because because I really think that the the mess the musical message is great, but I also think that the lyrical message is really important. Yes. I mean, the poker gaze everybody's like, ah, oh, the lyrics don't matter, or well, the music doesn't matter. Music doesn't matter. It's all about you. Know, whatever that is, I think it, it, it all it's all about you know the sum of all parts. Right. Um, you know, and I don't like to. I don't really like to. Um, I mean, my trip is not. Uh, sorry, it's not really all about. I, I. I mean, me, me. I mean, you know, it's personal. But I mean, I like to come at it from. Uh, you know, I, I like to come at it from a, just from a more. Uh, more, I don't know, more psychedelic or more, uh, I don't know. I don't know really how to describe it. I mean, I'm not trying to dial it into like, you know, oh, yeah, the, the chicks and the booze. I mean, you know, but they, it, it is true, though, really. I mean, they're either love songs, life songs, or drug songs, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think what... You know what I'm saying, though, right? Yeah. No, yeah. I think the way we would describe it would be thinking man's music. And there's nothing wrong with that. I prefer... Thank you good lyrics i really really do i mean um and what i like about the style you write is and i think what so many appreciate now i'm not trying to make this a kiss ass session or anything no, I, hear you, brother. I, I hear you you know i'm simply I'm just, hard, man. I'm hard. but but like bob seeger you know artists <laughs> like that um even even sometimes when jim jimmy jim um Jim Morrison got a little bit weird. He still, there was still a lot of grounding and, and he could still feel, I think that's why he had such a big following of, of fa- fans because even the kind of esoteric poetic stuff he wrote, there was still some substance in there of life that you could kind of relate to. And, I, and that's how I feel about the obsessed. To me, my all time favorite song, it's kind of a more, um, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's kind of a, like a raw kind of caveman, but it still has a lot of feeling to me is punk crusher i love that fucking song oh, great you know? great we, yeah. we've been doing we do it now we do it in our set nice i'm glad, I'm glad, glad you said that i'm glad to know that I'll, I'll, that's gonna i'll remember that right and that was the last full-length album you've done sacred right and yeah, it, it, that yeah. was what 2019 yeah okay so when can we expect some new music uh, as far as a uh, you know uh, an obsessed album goes and all that other stuff what what are we looking at here well, we, we actually had some recording time books like, you know, last year um, with all the unfortunate, you know, events that happened and a lot of turmoil, we pushed it back. Uh, actually, we were supposed to start recording uh, in October, at the beginning of October, but the tour is going to over, is going to inf- uh, encroach on that. So I'm pushing it back, I hope, to where we're actually going to start in the studio recording sometime in mid to late October. And um, it's good. Our next record, as far as I know right now, I haven't talked to Todd in a while, but as far as I know, our next record is going to be on Ripple. Um, it's going to be called uh, Designed to Divide. Cool. And um, yeah, so we've got the tunes and we just, we're, now we had another guitar player, you know, Jason was talking about him. So now it's a whole new ball game. So now they, so that's, I'm bringing the ideas I already had for the record. We're now fussy, you know, restructuring and uh he's bringing some great ideas to table two and chris our new bass player man he's he's got some ideas i mean everybody's really like up up in the game and so we're i know i know it's important we get something out quick and really those are my two life goals my two life goals are the next record you know the next record the next record that's it 
that's that's right. the goal. There you go. All right. Well, a couple more quick questions. Um, one is kind of uh, I don't know if it's even possible to happen, but I'm not sure what night Red Mesa plays. But any chance so, you might jam with them? It's, it's happening. <laughs> yeah, it's happening at at yes. Monolith. It's already asked me so. All right. Hey. So, I'm yeah. gonna, you let the cat out of the bag, or what? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, because this is going to be before that. <laughs> so yeah, so. they asked me to sing "This Harmony Some Life," and and I, I agreed to do it. Um, and, you know, when you do projects like that, like obviously that's a, that's the song I sing every day. So I'm I'm boning up, and you know, we'll by the time we get to uh, Taos, I'll be ready to do it. <laughs> I think Roman's going to kick my ass for letting the cat out of the bag, but is he really? Oh <laughs> shit! You know what? It has to be done, and you know what? This makes it that much more intriguing and fun. I was really hoping. I, I honestly didn't think Red Mesa was playing the same night, so I was like, "Well, you know, I don't. I, I, know, I know you're not there for the whole thing. You, you know, you got to." Well, I hope. I wonder if he. I wonder if he's talking. I think he's talking about Taz. I wonder if he's talking about Albuquerque. I'm, I think he's talking about Taz. I was pretty sure that he asked me to do it in Taz. Yeah. Because we, we are playing with Red Mesa and Albuquerque when I'm playing right. acoustic. But I'm pretty sure that it, it's going to be uh, the night that the chess plays. Yeah, I'm pretty cool. Sure. Well, if it's uh, if it's both nights, then that's even better for sure, man. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> cool. Why not? If, if I sing it once, I might as well do it again. You know? Right. Yeah. You're going to be in the same uh, same same area. It's, so it's, dark trip, it's a dark trip. And, you know, I don't want to bring people down. You know, with that, I mean, but it's, it's a heavy. And, Weirdly enough, you know, the timing was was pretty weird on that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, man, this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> we have to catch up and do it some more. And I'm yeah. glad that we did it in an ability in a way where we, you know, there's not all this craziness going on. You know, I can see you're comfortable in your place. I'm comfortable here at my home. And, and uh, you know, I, I just kind of put this together this last week. I, you know, text you and it's like, oh, man, let's let's do it. You know, and let's get this out before the monolith on the Mesa and the other show here in New Mexico for sure. Brother, I love your enthusiasm, man. I'm more than more than happy to do, to talk to you anytime. Right on, right on. All right, so let me let me mention a few things here. So, Monolith on the Mesa is happening on Friday, the 16th, 17th, and 18th in Taos, New Mexico. The Obsessed, featuring our guest Wino here, will be playing on the 16th, which is the Friday night, and then they will be returning. Wino will be returning to Launchpad here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on Monday, the 27th of September. Um, he's also got Wino, the documentary that is out, and you can, uh, we'll put up all the uh, links to, to your websites. And, the, and the, trailer's out. the trailer's out. The trailer's out, excuse me. Uh, new term, uh, newterms.com and then wino-art.com if you want to look at some of the art and jewelry. And we've got some really cool stuff out there. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's new dash terms. New dash terms, excuse yeah, me. New dash yeah. terms. Yeah. Well, we'll have it, like I said. So, we'll at the end of the uh, at the end of this program, uh, keep an eye out for the credits and all the links to Wino and the Obsessed will be up there, including the the, the um, trailer to the documentary. Cool. And um, is there anything else that I've uh, neglected to uh, to bring up that you'd like to talk about before we close? Man, all I, all I can say is that um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to people. Uh, all I want to do, all we want to do is bring the music out and, uh, you know, we'll let the music talk. Awesome, man. It's been a pleasure because not only did we talk about what are the things, the things that are going on, but you, you uh, took us in depth into some of the historical things that have been a part of, of Wino's life. Uh, you know, the, the probot story was great and some of the other things that you told us. So I really want to thank you for your candor. And I always wish you, wish you success. You're, you're a brother of mine, big, huge, huge obsessed fan. And I can't wait to see you on the monolith on the Mesa, as well as here in Albuquerque at the launch pad. Wino, much success always to you, man. And we'll be seeing you soon. Much respect, brother. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And thank you, your uh, significant other, for letting us know about the documentary. We're looking forward I to it. I will. Fantastic. Right. Yep. Once again, Wino, Scott, Wino, Weinrich, and this has been Zero Hour Squared Classics. Keep an eye out for the monolith on the Mesa as well as the Obsess, and we will be talking to you soon. Thank you, Wino. Take care, brother. Right, brother. Yep. Later.